Amen. Go ahead and remain standing, if you would, uh, for the reading of God's Word. You got half a crunch in if you started to sit there. <laughs> Add that to your workout routine today. 1 John chapter 2, beginning at verse 15. 1 John chapter 2, beginning at verse 15. Uh, I want to thank Josh for filling in, and, and uh, I love how he how he worships and includes the word, and how he's praying the whole time too. And I, I want to remind you that uh, and you have that opportunity also uh, to intercede for yourself and for those around you as we go through uh, as we go through the entire part of the service. And uh, you can do that quietly in here. You can go out and we'll find your room. And you can you can pray for the service out there as well. But uh, I praise the Lord for. For that, uh, pray and pray continually. First John chapter two, begin verse fifteen. The scripture says, "Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him." By the way, I'm reading from the New American Standard, and uh, we weren't able to get that, but but you'll get the gist. Verse sixteen: For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh. And the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away and also its lusts, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. Father, I thank you for this word. I thank you for how timely it is. I thank you for how timeless it is. Lord, I pray that you would help us to understand. I pray that you would help us to, to comprehend today what it is that you would have for us in this place, in this time, in this season. Father, with all that you have granted us and all that you have gifted us and empowered us with, I pray that, that you would help us to understand your direction and your mission in a world that is so fallen and broken. Lord, we love you and we need you. In Jesus' name, amen. This, uh, I, I love I love the book of First John because it's so it's so matter of fact. It's 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 easy to understand. It's easy to comprehend. The the word is is strong, and he just kind of lays it out. You don't have to you don't have to be a scholar. As a matter of fact, most of the scripture you don't have to be a scholar if you just allow and ask the Holy Spirit to minister to you as you would read His Word. He'll open up His Word to you. And this is one of those places. I, I love that in, the, in, in chapter 1 and 2, he talks about, I, I write this to you so that you will not sin. I, the plan, the desire of God is to give us the, not just the possibility, but the probability that we can walk above sin. The world says that you can't do that, that you've got to be all messed up. You've got to walk in sin. You've got to walk in the muck and the mire and the things of of this world, and when, uh, but God is saying, you know, you can rise above. But He also goes on. He says, however, if you do sin, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Now that's actually something that a lot of Christians need to hear, especially if you've grown up in a holiness tradition, because sometimes you're wondering, man, where am I with God? I did mess up. I blew up with my wife, or I, I, I bit my brother, or this or that, and the other thing. I shouldn't have said that, but uh, we're going through a biting thing in the daycare, and I guess that was on my mind. Uh, but but or, so there's this or that or the other thing, you know. And, and I've done this. Am I in? Am I out? Am I right with God? Where's my standing and stuff like that? But what Jesus says is, listen, I write this to you so you will not sin. In other words, the instructions that John is giving, that Jesus inspired him to write, the Holy Spirit gave to him to write down, he's saying, I'm giving this to you so that you can live above it. But if you do, if you do sin, you have this advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous. He also says that he gives us this opportunity. He says that if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God's been dealing with me on, on righteousness and understanding righteousness because sometimes we can be caught up so much in sin consciousness that we don't grasp and hold on to the righteousness that God actually 
intends for us to have. And I, I'm, I'm realizing, I'm sorry, I'm dense, it's taken me so long in my life, in my spiritual life, to, to, to grasp this, but I'm getting bombarded with it from several different directions that I respect about understanding that in Christ I'm righteous. Okay, I'm going to get in on that later. That's not what today's about because God's still dealing with me. I'm not ready to pop that one, but bring that to you, burst that bubble to you. But, but man, it's powerful. It's incredible. But so, and so he says, he, he, he takes away this unrighteousness. He's faithful. He's just to remove it, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness because we are righteous in Christ. Then he goes on and he talks about all these other things, why he's writing to them, talks about being an advocate and all of that. And then he gets down to this passage, and, and I love this passage. It's very straightforward. It's very, it's, it's very real and very practical. And he says, do not love the world, nor the things in the world. Now, uh, we have some beautiful songs I remember as a kid singing and stuff like that about uh, this is my father's world and, and things. And he talks about the rocks and the trees and the singing of nature and all that beautiful song. I hope we still sing it somewhere in the children's church. Probably, maybe don't, but, but, but just an awesome, awesome kind of a kid's hymn that we used to sing and talk about the beauty of nature and the reality that, that Paul tells us in Romans that all of nature points to a creator. All of nature addresses the reality that there is a, a grand designer. There is a God out there in all of the points, whether it's the intricacies of our body or a dandelion or, 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 or a rose or the majestic mountains or the reefs of the sea or whatever it is. It all points to the reality that it didn't just happen. There is a creator. And so, so we, we have this reality. We have this truth in the word. And when he says, do not love the world, he's not saying don't love nature. He's not saying that whatsoever. He's not saying don't enjoy the mountains, don't enjoy the surf. He's not, he's not saying that at all. What he's talking about in the world, he's talking about the evil system that man has created through the perversions of the enemy, through the devil, who is desire, his total and complete desire, is to steal, kill, and destroy he wants to hurt you. He wants to hurt yours. He wants to hurt your family. He wants to hurt your children. He wants to destroy you. He knows that his time is short and he's doing everything he can to make a mess of as many lives as he can. And he has created a system that man actually for a long time maybe thought even was common sense. And now even common sense seems to have disappeared. Jesus, when he's speaking in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, listen to you, and he says, maybe you have heard that it have said, thou shalt not murder. We've talked about this in the past. The Jew heard that and said, okay, it's all right. I just, I shouldn't murder. But man, I hate that guy. I really hate him. Matter of fact, I hate him so much, I think what I want to do, I'm going to buy a special knife that I would murder him with if I could. I'm not going to do it because the word says not to murder, but I'm going to think about it. I'm going to hold on when I'm thinking about it. I'm going to hold that knife. Matter of fact, you know what? I'm going to figure out the way that he would go. I'm going to think about it. I'm going to consider it. I know that after work each evening, he goes and he cuts down this alley, and there's a couple of corners, dark corners in that alley, and I could hide in one of them, and I'm just going to do that sometime. I'm just going to sit there, and I'm going to think about what it would be like to plunge that knife in his back as he passes by. And they really think that they're okay, but Jesus says, you've heard it said, thou shalt not commit murder. I say, you don't even hate. Matter of fact, a little bit later, Jesus even says, love your enemies. Not only don't have the absence of hate, but actually pray for, love your enemies. Last week we talked a lot about the way of the world versus the way of God. And man, this, this could be a whole year-long series on the way of the world versus the way of God. Another thing Jesus says is, you've heard it said, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say to you, don't even lust. Wow. So the Jew thought, okay, well, I can't commit adultery. I'm married. She's married. We can't do that. I, I, but man, I, she's amazing. I can, I can 
sure think about it. I can dwell on that thought. I can dwell all day. Matter of fact, when we're working together, I can, I kind of brush alongside of her. I can get close enough to smell her perfume. I can just. When Jesus says, "You've heard it said, Thou shalt not commit adultery," but I say. Don't even lust. Matter of fact, don't even lust, but respect. Cherish. Love, not in the erotic way, but in the full, complete, perfect, selfless love of God. And you see, the world today is this uh, one upmanship, it's this. I'm bigger than you, I'm stronger than you, I'm more powerful than you, I've, I've got this and that and the other thing. I'm, 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 I'm better in all these different ways. It's dog eat dog. It's, it's look out for number one, and number one is all that matters, and, and things like that. It's this selfish, self-centered world. And John, through the Holy Spirit, goes on to begin to explain what he's actually talking about and to and to kind of flesh it out, if you will. He says, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now again, he's not talking about nature. He's not talking about respecting nature and the mountains and the oceans and, and the plains and the purple mountain majesties and the golden grain and all this stuff. He's not saying that. He's talking about the system. He's talking about the evil system. Don't love it. Don't fall in love with it. For all that is in the world. And now he explains the world. And he starts with the lust of the flesh. The lust of the flesh. Wow. If you see, he's talking about that sensual. It's about sensual things. And it's not just it's not just sexual things, but sensual things. I didn't pick the first Sunday did I? Okay. <laughs> It's sorry, thanks. Sorry about sensual things, though. If it feels good, do it. it, it, it if, if, if it's too consenting adults, do it. If it's all kinds of things. You see, we live in this world where common sense once kind of told you what was decent and what was not, which actually truly stemmed from the Word of God. But now we're in a world where freedom of speech really doesn't mean freedom of speech. As a matter of fact, if you say something and it offends me, then, oh, we've got to call out the PC police. How stupid is that? Freedom of speech is freedom of speech. You may not like what I have to say, and I might not like what you have to say, but you have the freedom to say it. People today are fighting, and a lot of times what they're fighting for is the right to perversion. That they fight, fight for the perversion of sex. Sex outside of marriage, sex outside the consecrated bed of marriage is a perversion, whatever it is. And yet people fight for that. And we've kind of, you know, in a lot of ways maybe lost that battle to the point that we're even having to fight it in the church. But the fight should continue as we're fighting. Amen. 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 I bugged the tar out of me when we went to Israel this last week or last month or whatever. We went to Israel and I got out these rainbow colored uh, a rainbow colored straps to put around our luggage. <laughs> I, 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 it's just a thing to make it easy for me to pick out my luggage and my wife's luggage and my daughter's luggage as we're going around the world. So when it goes through, you see that, but man, I got some odd looks. <laughs> and it, it drives me nuts. The rainbow is a promise from God. And he'll not destroy the world again with a flood, but they've taken it over. And they've made it something that they think is beautiful, but it is destructive. It isn't right. It is perversion. And if 
that person doesn't come under the reality of the grace of Jesus Christ there in the world of trouble.
products and all of that that he was supposed to do. He'd just take a mop real quick and wipe up any spills he saw. And because of that poor performance that he had, they would have to strip and wax the floors every Christmas and every summer. They'd have to, they have to completely do it at a great expense. Now, now I, I just got off the machine, they said, and I started doing it and all of that thing, and he started getting real upset because it would take me a few hours where the way he would do it, it'd take him about an hour, and then the rest of the night he'd go off somewhere. We didn't know where he'd go off to and things like that, but that's what he would do. One night, he opened up his lunchbox, and the lunchbox was lined with pornography. The, the hole inside, I mean, it was like, boom. Didn't need to see that. Then he lifted his clipboard, and on the back of the clipboard was a centerfold that he had, he had taped over on the back of the centerfold. And I was a young seminarian, and I immediately, man, I was hurting for him. And I, I would try to talk to him and talk to him about the Lord and, and talk to him about God's love for him and things like that. And he said, man, all I care about is pornography. So that's all I care about. I've got a wife and stuff, but man, I love to go to certain places where prostitution's legal, and I go down there when I save up some money. And, and he said, the other thing I do is I went, and I went to the rent center, and I bought the biggest TV they had. And he said, all that I do all day long is I watch porn. And he said, they promised me that if this TV goes out because I'm renting it and don't own it, that they will have another one to me if this one goes out within an hour. So for years, I rent a TV. And he said, what I do here is I go off and I go sleep somewhere in the building so that I can just watch pornography all day long. And there's a real pornography problem in our world today. I know what I had to deal with when I was a kid. The things I faced with some guy that his dad found his dad's stash or whatever somewhere. Every once in a while you get exposed to it as a kid. But today you can carry around a computer that's far greater than anything that was on Apollo 11. And you can look up Bible verses. You can call your mother and you can look up. And our kids are exposed to it. And now it's not just the boys as much as it is the girls as well. And it's and it is strangling and it's killing and it's an addiction that grabs a hold of people and it's it's suffocating the life out of people. The world and its desires are passing away. The second one that he talks about is the lust of the eyes. The lust of the eyes. My biggest problem with the lust of the eyes is a menu. <laughs> or, or an all-you-can-eat place. I think anything that's all-you-can-eat, I should really just not even go in. <laughs> because I have this clean-your-plate mentality that was ingrained in me when I was a kid. You will clean your plate. And back then it was whether you like it or not, you will clean your plate. And then if you were a grandma, she you cleaned your plate and she loaded it up again, you will clean your plate. And that's okay when you're 12, 15, 16, 18, that's all right. But when you're not so good. What the lust of the eyes is, though, is where you're just never really satisfied. I want one more car, or I want one more this, or one more that, or one more company. I got this model, but I want another. It's not bad to improve. Please, please don't hear that. But it's when a lust for more consumes you. That all you care about is another one. J.D. Rockefeller was an amazing, amazing industrialist. As a matter of fact, because of reading the scriptures and hearing about the tar that was put on the on the ark, he realized that somewhere over in the Middle East, 
there must be oil. And so he went over there and began in Saudi Arabia and stuff the, the, the location of trying to find oil. And because of his ability to find oil, he raised up a company called Standard Oil that was worth today's money would be about $340 billion. Be about four or five times more than Bill Gates. He raises up this incredible company and it's so big that they begin to charge him with monopoly type things, monopolistic things. And in 1911, they broke up his companies and out of his companies were four other companies that were produced. They were out of standard came Chevron, Mobile, uh, Amico, and, uh, and one other. And those four today are still within the top 50. He had so much money and so much power. And when he came to be interviewed, they asked him the question, how much money is enough? And he said, just one more dollar. And when he got that one, just one more. Just one more. Again, I really believe that God desires to equip us and to empower us and to resource us. And, and I've seen time and time again where somebody who's throwing their life away comes to Jesus Christ and God raises them up. He elevates them in all kinds of ways. Socially, he elevates them. Financially, he elevates them. He does all kinds of, of beautiful things in their lives. I believe that's a part of God's plan. I, but if it's money, and if it's the love of money, there's a real problem. Becky's cousin was a, and he's a, just a sharp guy. We loved him. Becky grew up with him and just, just a neat kid. They were about the same age and stuff. And his family, they started a company with just wrought iron, just doing a little ornamental iron for porches and stuff that used to be popular back in the 60s and 70s and whatever. They started in their garage, but it quickly grew and it became quite a steel company, <coughs> steel company. And, and if you've ever been to an Opryland Hotel, or you've been over here to the hotel, uh, what's the one over here? Huh? The Gaylord Hotel. The steel structure in there of the atrium and the steel of the building and stuff is stuff that their steel company did. And it, they have companies down in several locations and a private jet and all these different things that take them from location to location. They have, they have penthouses in different cities and all of these things. And, and, and Becky, would talk to him and love on him about Jesus and try to share with him about Jesus and he just he was so full of all the things that he had and all the things that he could do and he, he drove her and his Mercedes for the homecoming parade and all these different things and, and in every way he was a neat guy except he didn't love Jesus he got his high school girlfriend pregnant and so uh, he kind of college just kind of fizzled for a while but his dad bought him a company and gave him a company and things like that. And yet things just kind of went south and stuff. Not The company was fine, but he and the girlfriend split up and things. And, and, and it just wasn't real pretty. One night I remember we got a call and, and he was returning home from a club late at night. It was 2 or 3 in the morning and he was coming around one of the Tennessee curves and he was in his car and fancy convertible and as he's coming around the car there's the curb there's three guys that are trying to escape the police and they've turned off their lights while they're going through the hills of Tennessee and they hit both of them going around 70 miles an hour and the and the hood of his car went through his windshield and took his head off He'd always told Becky, he said, not now, later, not, not now. I, I hear you, I know about Jesus, I hear you, but not now, later. I remember when we went to the funeral, we went to the funeral there in Nashville, and then there, were, there were songwriters, and there were celebrities, and, and there were long limousines and everything, and the place was packed out. I listened to absolutely the worst funeral sermon I've ever heard. 
And when the guy had an opportunity, it's like he didn't even know the family because they didn't go to church and stuff. But it was a miserable sermon. And he didn't even share about Christ or anything like that. Just some glib verses that he knew. And, and then when it was over, but one of the things that I'll never be able to get out of my mind was, was when the big black limousine pulled up that, that his family was in. The chauffeurs got out, they opened the doors, the bodyguards and stuff, and they, and I remember just as they got his mother out, I heard the most horrible wailing I've ever heard in my life. And she collapsed, and they picked her up, and they tried to help her walk, and they finally just had to carry her in. And that wailing continued throughout the whole service, and they're not even on the way out. And on the way out, the boy had said, one of the things that the family did, kind of getting back to their roots every year, was they would have this big, beautiful garden, rose garden with other perennials and annuals and all these other flowers around it, really sculptured high on the hill of the farm that, is, that the grandparents had owned. And, and it was just this beautiful thing in their mansion set high up on the hill. And, and, and he had said when they were doing that earlier in that spring, he said, you know what, if I ever die, I want to be buried over here under this old tree. So I don't know what all they had to do, but they arranged for him to be buried there. And we took that long drive, and you could not see the end of the cars. When we got to that hillside, we were sitting up on the mansion drive and stuff, and cars just kept coming in, and they're pulling in on this huge lot. There were hundreds of cars that pulled in, and this crowd comes up and surrounds the place where he's going to be buried, and all you could continue to hear was the wailing of that mother. See, the scripture says, do not love the world for the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the world itself are, is passing away. And I know that to be true. Now the third thing that John tells us here from the Holy Spirit about the world is the boastful pride of life. The boastful pride of life. I don't know about you, but I, I hate braggarts. I oops, I shouldn't say hate. I love them, I just really don't like them. And, and I expect, you know, the guy that everything's better of his and every you know, I, I, I used to know a guy that it didn't matter what it was, you could tell a story, you could try to make up the greatest story that's ever been told and and make it more amazing than anything you could ever think and imagine and he would come right after something that was bigger that he had done and his brothers had done. I remember buying a shotgun one time and being pretty proud of it for what I had and things like that. And he he said, oh, well, me and my brother, we have these two and they're amazing and they're do all this. Besides that, they're consecutive serial numbers and all of this kind of thing. And then he was telling us about it, you know, and, and, and that's one thing. That's he's, he, he's, he's bragging, but the thing about him was that when he would brag about something, he really had it. He, he did have it. it. It was his. The shotgun was his. The motorcycle he used to brag about it. It really was his, and it was beautiful. It was amazing. But this word is a different word. It's alazonia in the Greek, and, and it actually means somebody who boasts about something they do not have. I heard about the young preacher. The young preacher, he, he's settling into his new office and stuff, and they've rearranged some things, and, and they've moved him to a different office and stuff in the church and stuff, and he gets there, and, he, and there's a knock at the door, and he really wants to impress the person at the door. So he picks up the phone, he says, would you just hold a minute? He said, I'm, I'm going to call him. He says, hello, uh, Queen Elizabeth, yes, I, I'm so excited about how how you're doing, and that you're the longest reign, and that you've kept Charles out of power all of this time, and, and I, I, all of that's great, and I don't like Camilla either, and all of these different things that, that he, you know, he said, but yeah, I'll come over and I'll pray for your next birthday and stuff like that, and then he, and then he hangs up the phone, he said, oh, wait a minute, I got another call, he picks it up, hello, oh, oh, oh President Trump, yes, I can go for that prayer break, whatever you think of it, I can come to that prayer breakfast. And then he hangs up the phone, and when he hangs up the phone, he looks at the guy and says, very humbly, yes, can I help you? 
the guy raises up his toolbox and says, I'm here to hook up the phone. <laughs> She's bragging about relationships she doesn't have. Remind me of something else when I was, when I was growing up, I, at the age of 12, I started delivering papers and I uh, carried a bag and ride my bike and put the papers in the mailboxes and throw them on the lawns and whatever. Go around and collect and stuff. And one of the places that on my place up in Nebraska was was uh, this one house that was actually more garage than house. It was really just a shop with a couple bedrooms, a kitchen, and a bathroom on the end of it. And when I would go in there, it was always some kind of a cool thing. It was and, and, and because the guy was one of the only certified at that time Jaguar dealers in the Midwest. And so he would get Jaguars from all over, like nine different states that would come into Omaha. And he would bring me in, and every time he'd show me how awesome they were, and he'd show me all the different features and stuff. And I learned to, you know, recognize the Walnut World Dash and the, and the World Walnut Dash and all of that, and the, the Walnut Stick Shift and, and, and the steering wheel that was made out of wood and all those things, and just power and sleek and the ones with the big nose that were just the, the coupes of the J series and then the others that were uh, sedans and stuff like that. And I remember one time I went in there and I was probably 12, 13, and, and I went in and, and, and there was this one that was kind of a, it almost looked like a Porsche, but it was a, but it, but it was a Jaguar and he said, come here, I want you to see something. And he opened up the hood, and then there was the standard 12-cylinder engine that every Jaguar, or most of them, had anyway. And it, it was just this German muscle power engineering, all of this stuff that was in there. And it took up this huge area of a motor, and, and that was so impressive. But I'd seen that before, and he said, but look at the side of this. And as we looked into the side, inside the frame, the frame itself was made out of wood. And he said, this is one of them that was produced during the war, and it's very rare, and because they had to, they had to use all the metal they could for the war effort, so it's made of wood on the inside. And back then, if I remember right, I think he said that back then in the 70s, that vehicle was worth about $500,000. Because most of them have been destroyed in the war. And there were only a handful of them left. And it was, and this guy was getting to work on it. Well, it gave me this real appreciation for Jaguars. Well, later when I went on to college in Olathe, I was there and one day I'm driving down, I'm driving down Santa Fe and, and there was this old, really reputable car lot called Melody Motors. I doubt it's still there, but Melody Motors. And on there, as I'm driving by, there is this yellow Jaguar, real light yellow tan roof. It was gorgeous. So what I noticed on it, it had the, it had the wire wheels, it had the right wheels, it had everything. It was so incredible. And in white shoe polish on the front, it said $1,200 OVO. Now, I was a poor college kid, but I would have done everything I could to find $1,200 to go get that Jaguar. I did a U-turn on Santa Fe. I pulled into that place. I started looking it over closer. The paint job was really nice. Inside was that burled walnut uh, uh, dash and, and everything. And it had the wooden steering wheel. It had uh, leather seats, kind of a caramel colored seats and everything. And I, man, it was great. The guy comes out and wants to help me. He says, you like to look at this? I said, yeah, I want to see the engine. He popped open the engine. And I looked down into this empty cavern, and I found in there, not the 12-cylinder Jaguar engine, but a four-cylinder Pinto engine. <laughs> <laughs> On the outside, it said everything. It, it had the Jaguar emblem, it had the wire wheels, it had the walnut, all, it had everything. It's saying, it was saying on the outside, I have 12 cylinders of get up and go, get out of the way. But on the inside, it was saying, boop, boop, boop.
to share with you in the next few weeks about our righteousness and where we stand in righteousness. In the righteousness of Christ, not our own, because our own is like filthy rags. But on the other hand, for you to receive that righteousness, you need to be like in the first part of the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5, where Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, which actually means blessed, favored by God, are those who realize that they are bankrupt spiritually. See, that, that's the beginning. I realize I need God. I realize I can't do it on my own. I realize that this life is throwing stuff at me that in the long run anyway, I'm not going to be able to handle it. And I really do need God. I need the Creator. I, I need Him. So there's there's this spiritual bankruptcy that I need to recognize that I can't save myself. And I need Him. Amen. On April 11th at 1156, 1962, my mom was in the emergency room because she was, she had blown up. My dad, when he came in, when I actually let him in, he didn't think it was her because she was so swollen. He, and she'd almost died giving birth to me. And, and at 1156, the doctor raised me up on my feet, swatted me on my hand in, and I began to cry and And if I'm honest with you, every breath since has been a gift from God. Right. Everything since, every accomplishment, every half success, <coughs> and even every failure has been something that God has allowed to pass through his hands. And really the beginning of hope in Christ the beginning of the peace and the joy that God intends for each and every one of us is recognizing that. We can brag about the things we've accomplished. We can talk about all of these things. And there are things, choices we make and stuff like that, that are a genuine cause and effect in this world and the relationship we have with God. But in the end, it's so important, whether you're the poorest guy on earth or the wealthiest, that you recognize your ultimate and what this what this passage ends with it says the world is passing away you see the lust of the eyes the lust of the flesh and the boastful pride of life all of it's passing away all the self-centeredness, all of the evil systems, all the dog-eat-dog -dog situations that are in this world, all of the jealousy, covetousness, adultery, perversion, all, all of the murder and hate and racism and all of that stuff, it's all passing away. But what he does say is, the one who does the will of God lives forever. Amen. The one who does the will of God. Please pray. Father, I thank you. This world is so enticing. And really, there's a lot of good things that we can accomplish even in a, even with an imperfect mindset. Father, we recognize today that what you desire is for us to have a genuine heart set after you. As a matter of fact, your word tells us, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds through the reading of the word. Father, just as Josh stated this morning about being drawn into the Word more and more, I pray that you would do that to every one of us. Father, we would take time out of our schedules. We, we would make time. We would push things aside for the priority of your Word, the priority of allowing you the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was... I pray that we would make time to 
who will spend time with you, just you. We know you're with us all day long, but, but time with us that's intimate, that's personal, that's in the Word, where you are ministering to us. Father, I pray that that would be the reality. That you would have your way. And Father, that we would not be people of the world. See, the world says hit them back. And Jesus says turn the other cheek. And we'd not be of the world, but Father, we would be what you want us to be. We would be of you, of your kingdom, and your way.